It is a Thursday, February 15th. Welcome to the EST Hango presented by White Claw Hard Seltzer. The difference is a clear Matawanek with you here today. Joining us, as he does every Thursday, it is Joaquin Gage, uh, former NHLer, two guys in a goalie, which will be later today, and a judge of hot takes. He's still got a little piece of... Uh, oh, some hair. Wig. Yeah, Who wig in the hair. It's all right. Who uh, it? Eric by a... Just, <laughs> a, sl- right. it's just a hair. Right. Just be- beat him in a, in a one-on-one battle. And we got Murray McCourt from the VIP Golf Show. He joins us uh, each week. And uh, we've got a Briar champion. He's going to his ninth Briar <laughs> in a couple of weeks with Team Cooey. It is the lead to Kark Martin. Kark, thanks for coming by and uh, thanks for joining the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's going to be fun. Like, this is a great time of the year because we've got Scotty starting up tomorrow. And it's it like there's the Grand Slam of curling. There's a lot of curling going on all year. But... For like the Canadian championships and stuff, these are like two of some of the best weeks. Yeah, yeah, it's on all the time on TV. I, I love watching it. I love playing in it. It's a great time of year. Do you actually watch the Briar in the draws where you're not playing? Yeah, you do. Yeah, eh? yeah, yeah, it's it's on all the time. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you like to look at like tendencies of other teams and stuff? Is there certain ways that other teams play, or a is little... it all si- situational? No, there's definitely tendencies, but. Uh, like we play them so much that oh, you kind of we know. we know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's great. Not a lot of surprises. <laughs> yeah, how many teams like would you face? Like I'm assuming you've looked at the roster for for the upcoming round. How many of those teams yeah. would you never have faced, or have you pretty much faced uh, them the, all type of thing? There's a couple new ones, but uh, yeah, the the top end of the Briar, it's the same guys, and you know what to expect out of them. Yeah, and well, not that it's we were just talking about this uh, offline, but is and not that these guys are in the Briar, but. A year ago, when we sit around and talk about curling, a dean from Sweden was literally unbeatable. Yeah. This year, everyone's beaten him. Uh, return as at the, from Italy at the beginning of the year was unbeatable. He said he's like thirty and two, and now in the last whatever six weeks, he's he's five hundred. So, how how does that work? Yeah, no, like, I think guys get hot if you get on a roll. You. Uh, similar to the Oilers no. <laughs> lately, they, yeah, you get on a roll, you win a bunch in a row, and knock, yeah, knock a whole bunch of the top guys off, and then you kind of slow down. It's just uh, kind of peaks and valleys. The yeah. confidence yeah. just gets yeah. really high when you get a couple. Yeah, of big and you wins get everyone, your all four guys rolling, and we. I think uh, it shows even in the Grand Slams. We won three in a row back in. Uh, 2019, Moet won three in a row, Jacobs won three in a row, Retorna has won three in a row now. Um, it kind of goes in stretches like yeah. that. Yeah, it's you get on a roll and you win, win a bunch. Have you gone to get curling? Have you ever been a curling? Oh, yeah. like, oh, like, I did. I, like, not, not play, because I know you're the champion of the Oilers alum or a previous well, no, I champ. lost this year. <laughs> you, were, you were a champ, I, but uh, like, were you ever a fan of curling? Yeah, of course. I, yeah. It's one of those sports where if it's on TV, I, w- I watch it. Because more so, well, my grandfather was a big curler uh, in the North Shore Winter Club back in, in Vancouver. And he had all the sweaters and stuff and his own rock from Ayrshire in Scotland from that big... I actually played there. There's a big rock where they used to get all the stone to make curling rocks from there. So um, I was always shocked because I was always so sore after the next day (laughs) from sweeping. And I didn't know what was... What's wrong? I thought I slept wrong or something, but behind my shoulder blade on my, on my well, I, I guess I shoot left, so it, yeah, it's my left shoulder blade was just completely seized up after sweeping. That's a, it's a hard sport. Like it's it's unbelievable. Like the finesse and strength that you need to to do certain things. It, uh, I always say the sign of a pro, true professional is making something look simple, and uh, that's what you guys do. Yeah, yeah, no, I guess just to that, it's we do have a good, um, a nice little record, I guess, going with the Oilers. Um, we've we've taken out probably eight or nine NHL teams over the last <laughs> ten years, and the Oilers have won every game after we've taken oh, them really? out curling. Oh, yeah, all right. <laughs> you you watch the guys after they've went curling, and they're look like they gotta stick up their butt or whatever because they, yeah, they all the muscles are tight the yeah. next day and yeah they they we've never the Oilers have won every game after <laughs> we've taken their competitors out who's the best curler from the team uh, from the Oilers the Oilers we well there's been there's been a few but no back um, 
Actually, some of the Red Wings had some some competitive guys oh, yeah? on it. Yeah, like uh, w- there's some Canadians, but even guys like Zetterberg and Lindstrom, oh. they could they could play. So oh, Swedes, yeah. It's an interesting point about the injuries you guys talk about with Crony and how you feel because that's something that until you know talking with Karg about it over the over the years like. The injuries that happen in the careers of some of the curlers get cut short because of injuries. And uh, us laymans that don't curl (laughs) at the level that they do, I mean, it shocked me that the injuries are that significant for some of these guys. Yeah, it's a lot of knee replacements, hip replacements. Really? I, ju- I just had knee surgery in really? the summer in August. Well, okay, but that was that, yeah, was, that was not different. from curling. That <laughs> but was playing fastball. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, or yeah. slow pitch. Slow yeah. pitch, sir. Yeah. Oh, how is slow but, pitch? But, slow pitch. Well, I just, just, just took a swing, but okay. I think your muscles get so tight yeah. in the areas that, yeah. yeah. But, uh, yeah, Dad has hip surgery that kind of at the end of his career and, Dad is Kevin like, Martin, yeah, by the way, for yeah, those that yeah, don't he, put two and yeah, two together. Yeah, curler just, ever. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, right at the top. Um, but, yeah, and, uh, yeah, a lot of the other top, like uh, Eve Mirror had won the Olympics. She's needed something like that in hip surgery or uh, John Morris. All, all Gushu, of them. too. Gushu, Gushu, yeah. Gushu's just, it's just a matter of time, I think. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it it's, takes a toll. Um, it's hard on certain areas of the body. Um, I played a lot of hockey till well, I age out junior, and mm-hmm. um, you get a lot of bumps and bruises, but, uh, yeah, curling's more a lot of strain on certain muscles, and, yeah, it ends up in replacements and stuff at the end of your career. Well, and curling over the last, like, 10 years or so, maybe a little bit longer, has really becomes, uh, it's about fitness. Like, back in, like, for me growing up and stuff, like, the stores, uh, it's just, it doesn't matter how my, how your body is. You just go curl, you go drink and all yeah, that, but it's now, exactly, like, yeah. It's changed. I'm, yeah. I'm guessing smoking and drinking. Exactly. On the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but now it's McDonald's, about McDonald's, tobacco, <laughs> prayer. And, and same with golf. It's about being in the gym. It's about working out. It's about getting as strong as possible and, and working whatever muscles you need to. Absolutely. And it's become this. Not anyone could just go pick it up and play it at a really high level. Yeah. You actually have to commit to it. Yeah. Basically, twenty four seven, three sixty five. Well, who was the? It wasn't it the American Skip that was kind of yeah, little still, heavy set and stuff. So he was. Everyone said he looked more like a curler, but uh, <laughs> but he did quite well that year, didn't he? he just, yeah, who, yeah. Who's yeah but he's a skip. He's not sweeping as much. Not sweeping as much. He's I not guess, being yeah. the lead out there, leader <laughs> second, getting out there and sweeping hard, you know. Oh god. But yeah, no, and he's had to get in shape now, and he oh. he's trim, and you wouldn't even recognize. Oh him really? Now. Who are you talking Sh- about? Is that Schuster? Schuster? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. yeah, he's really transformed over the last ten years, and it, it's just so competitive that. You have to be in shape to keep up, yeah. You know, and I, I as you know, I absolutely love watching curling, but I, I'm going to ask you a question about this because, like, say this weekend, I'm watching you uh, in the in Hinton on on YouTube. See, everyone's on YouTube now, <laughs> and so curling's on YouTube all the time. And but the announcers kept talking about how you are a master of controlling the rock. So, like, explain it. It's awesome, everyone. Like you're the sweeper, you're you're the lead. Obviously, one of the best leads in, in the world, if not the best lead in the world. And you're a master of controlling the rock. You don't throw it, but you control it. Yeah. Uh, so, like, talk about that. Yeah, that's one thing I love about curling. Um, in even ten, fifteen years ago, uh, you could make the rock go further, make it go straighter, and that's kind of all you thought you could do. And might you might make it go three or four feet farther and six inches straighter and that was it and now now with the new technology and new understanding of what you can do like we can probably impact the rock 10 feet of distance and a foot either direction curl or straight Um, so you're really affecting how the person throws that rock and or the how the shot's made what's the technology on it because i know yeah. there's the little like there's a edge on the bottom of the rock right yeah. but what 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 advancements over the last 10 years what have they done yeah the the pads um they, they actually the pads got so aggressive that they had to make new rules to to make the pads less aggressive um Oh, and, really? Yeah, there's uh, there's a type of fabric that is, um, it's called WCF compliant world curling 
compliant and that's the only fabric anyone can use so oh really it's, yeah it's um there's a lot more rules around it because the guys have gotten so big and strong and <laughs> been able uh, 2015 2016 we had some it's like called broom gate and, and you, <laughs> i remember that you, one you, yeah, i remember yeah. how big of a deal that was you, you could, all the stories you could written. do anything with the rock like you could just joystick it all over the ice oh, really? and yeah well if you think of other sports like if you could affect a, like a baseball or a football yeah. by 10 feet of distance and a couple feet of width, like you're really changing. It, it, it does put a lot of um, the, the game in the sweeper's hands, I guess, now. Wow. But even the side, the side of the rock that you sweep on and, you know, you sweep it on this corner of the rock or that corner of the rock or you see guys jump to the other side to get two guys on the one side of the rock. I mean, it's just the techni technical aspect of all that and, and the science really behind it is kind of crazy yeah yeah and it's just it seems like endless learning uh, to try <laughs> to keep keep a little advantage on some of these other teams and yeah you kind of see i think that's part of how these streaks happen too cause some guys figure something out and oh, yeah. and uh yeah then they, they get on a roll and then everyone catches up we've known about it for a long time you know but I'll get you to speak on it because you have to experience it now. But like Alberta is, especially on the men's side of curling, like a very difficult province to get out of. Like on it, how good are the rinks overall in this province? And so when you go and represent Alberta, like that's a big deal to go win this province. If you're like even just to back to when your dad was curling, because there's just so many great rinks that have historically have come here. Cooey's won four Briars. I think Furby's won four. Your dad's won four. Like that's all just from Alberta. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's the tough. It is the toughest province to get out of for sure, and uh, that's a huge. Congrats to uh, Sluchinski la this last weekend. They beat us in the final, and is the first time I think in I think thirty or so years that someone not Kevin or Brendan <laughs> won, like or Randy Furby, I guess, uh, if you want to go back to the nineties, even so. Uh, yeah. Well, let, let's talk about that for a second, though, because, and you're right, but in, in curling right now, I mean, it's Cooey and Botcher, yep. clearly the two, two, of the top. Two, yep. uh, two of the top eight teams in the in the world yep. are here in Alberta, but Botcher, y you knew you were in the Briar before, the, before uh, Alberta Provincials. Yep. Botcher knew he was in the Briar before, but, but he didn't have to participate in Alberta, but you guys did have to participate in Alberta, which to me made absolutely no sense and wasn't necessarily fair to Sluchinski and Sturme that, uh, to give them the opportunity to get into the Briar, which Sluchinski ended up being... But, like, what if, but if you didn't win, then he was still... Go if you beat him, he was still going anyway. So, like, why were you guys even there? Yeah, no, it's, it's tough. Uh, tough questions we have to ask Curling Canada sometimes, too. It just doesn't make any sense. But um, I think it's a bit of a transition. I know next year the three wild cards will be, um, will be picked in May. So then there will be none of this. It was a bit of a transition year. I think they wanted to give one team the ability um, to get the wild card throughout the year in that one transition year. And then moving on there the three wild cards will always be picked in may before the year starts so you might know if you're going in if you're a certain rink and then you don't have to take part in, in the we'll, play downs. we'll know after the players championship in april if we're in the bar or not okay yeah so <laughs> the defending champion was was it was in which was Gushu, Gushu, right? Yeah. and then matt dunstone was yeah. wild card two botcher wild card one and yeah. you guys are wild card three three which was all known before the alberta <laughs> provincials and whatnot but botcher and dunstone didn't have to per participate in their provincials but they made team cooey participate in the alberta provincials so to me it was all like it doesn't make any sense and and so i mean did you guys you guys didn't end up winning but you said you had a good week and you curled well, but like, were your heads really even in it when you when you knew that uh, you were already yeah, a, yeah, a no, to play? Definitely, it's de it's a different feeling for sure. Like when you're in kind of desperation mode to win that final, it's definitely a different feeling. But we like we find that week is it's a great week to just kind of tune up for the briar, and we wanted to be our best that week and. Um, we had some really good games and, yeah, got a lot of the week anyways. But, yeah, you can't compare it to the uh, kind of 
desperation of a final that one team goes and one team goes home. Yeah. What's like the pinnacle? Like when you're when you're curling, is it is it the Olympics? Is that the the big the yeah. Stanley Cup, so to speak? Or? Yeah, Olympic gold for sure. That's <laughs> yeah. That's, a, that's yeah. a great. Okay. Yeah, that's right. after. Well, and we're in that Olympic Bryce. qualifying yeah. cycle right now of curling, right? Yeah. Yeah. So it's the second year. Um, 2025 it has the uh, the trials are in Halifax. So the Olympic trials in Canada is kind of the biggest Canadian event we have. And mm-hmm. then if you win that and go to the Olympics, that's that's the pinnacle of the sport for sure. Okay. That's, that one's always so much fun to watch, oh. the curling at it. And yeah, I remember yeah. 2010, just hearing the crowd just singing, oh, Canada. The, the, yeah. But they like, sang it soft. Yeah. yeah. Like they were going to win, and they were just singing it softly. And even the, I think they were, they were up against the Norwegians, even they were like, this is a pretty cool moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean. Well, your dad... Yeah. Uh, twice, two time Olympic, Olympics? three, 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 Olympics? three times. Yeah, he three Olympics and yeah. two medals. Uh, yeah, so we kind of we all watched the uh, silver medal. He even slide just a couple inches too deep in Salt Lake, right. and then yeah, and then they just they they changed the whole how they were preparing for the next four years to. Oh really? Get to, yeah, like they changed the team, got younger, got fitter. Yeah. Really, um, that's what got me into it. Like they changed what I thought about the sport just with how they did things, and and then they came out with the gold. I think they just in Vancouver they they were just light years ahead of everyone else. They were a machine out there. Yeah, mm-hmm. it was just like domination yeah. on the men's side well, with, with the Martin team. John then. Morris was absolute perfect third for your dad, right? I mean. What a lethal backhand, John Morris and Kevin Martin. My goodness. Yep. Yeah, for sure. So, is, was your dad like a, a crazy curling dad, or did he? Did he... No, <laughs> no. no. The opposite. How do you, no. do you lean on him for advice in certain no. things, or does he let you go? Yeah, no. He like I see. It's funny nowadays. If I see him, they live in Palm Springs most of the time, and if I see him, it's at a curling event because he commentates our events, okay. but. Um, yeah, I'll get him to hold the broom once in a while for me, but it's uh, it's never been yeah like a crazy curling dad situation. <laughs> he, if anything, I, I played hockey seven days a week till I age uh, junior. So oh, okay. it was it was a crazy hockey family. And, and I've asked Clark that before, and like as a commentator, like I asked him like, how does Kevin uh, you know rate your t- or like analyze your team? And he says he's way harder on us than he is on anybody else because he doesn't want to. Yeah. Like yeah. he's, he's cheering for his kid in, <laughs> in that process. But, you know, when I was on the Hangout a couple of weeks back with Josh Clausen, he said that he was, he wasn't a weatherman. He was a, the a rapper. Raps, turned he's weather. a rapper who is a weatherman. Karak is one of the best curlers in the world, but he's, he'll tell you he's, he's a hockey player who curls. <laughs> he's not, not a curler who plays hockey. So, yeah. you know, it's just fascinating that how he, Curling's not even your passion. Hockey's your passion, and and yet you're one of the best in the world at what you do. That's kind of crazy. <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy how it all happened for sure. <laughs> how, how do you read the ice? Like a different, obviously you go to different places, different ice. But how do you get a good? Is it just practicing on it from the time you get there, or do you discuss it beforehand? Yeah, I think experience, practicing, watching, like even all those years watching Dad curl, I think gave me a hand, like a leg up on being able to read the ice and understand strategy. And um, and yeah, then also like we have an ice maker as our coach. Um, oh, okay. Just you, when he hears the plant kick in or whatever, <laughs> you know that the ice, the speed will change or the yeah. curl will change and. Um, every little advantage like that. We had Darren Molding on the team previous, and he was a great ice maker, and um, that's another way to really get into the ice conditions. Those ice makers know exactly what's going to happen before it happens. That's so, crazy. Yeah. Murray, what's it like how's it reading greens, though, for them? Like, there's, there's a lot of similarities, actually, between golf and yeah, curling, right? Yeah, and we, we talk like, about this stuff, uh, ah, stuff a lot. How do you go, sure. like, to a new course and stuff and read your greens? Wow. Uh, like, is it just experience then? It's just there yeah, that it's just figured out? a little out? bit. I mean, yeah. the more you play a, a course, it's like the, like, I was asking him already about the Briar Ice. Has he curled? Have they curled on before? Yes, they were in the Briar Final there, so they kind of already know a little bit about the ice and are comfortable with it. And it's the same if you play a golf course a lot. 
you kind of get used to what the greens are going to do. But if, if you're new to a course, yeah, you know, the speed, the grain, all those things are, are factors. And you can look at a putt and read it every way that you want to look at it. And then it doesn't go the way you think it's going to go. And that's just the way it goes. And it's probably similar with ice. You think this is going to happen. And then, you know, you hear all the time, it over curled. Well, the same thing in, in putting. You hit a putt and you're like, man, that broke way more than it <laughs> it looks like it should have. So, yeah, there's a lot of similarities in pace. This pace and everything uh, dictates what can happen with, with golf and it does in curling. But in curling, you get Carrick Martin sweeping the rock yeah. that can control it. I don't have anybody well, sweeping my my <laughs> putt that can stop it from breaking and get it to go in the hole for me. But, well, also, yeah. they get to keep throwing the same sheet the rest of the the match. Right. We you have to go to a new green each time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you adjust mid round when you're having well, that? Oh, I mean, it's still, you'd like to think that all 18 greens, uh, even though they have different undulation on them, the, the greens are going to run all at the same speed. And so the consistency between them and how they should run, knock on wood, is going to be pretty consistent. So even though there's different breaks and different undulations, the the way they should react and the speed of them should be consistent. So as you carry on, you should be able to adjust to that a little bit for sure. Did did the ice matter to you, Gager? Like because we always talk oh. about different ices in hockey. Edmonton had the best ice. You know, down south Dallas had the worst ice. How how does that affect the goalie? Well, I mean, it's different now. I'm sure because of the technology of the of the equipment, the pads they they slide better. Mm-hmm. You know, um, but I mean, you'd go down south to where it's humid and stuff, and by the end of the period, it would get it would almost get like a slurpy, right? <laughs> so you couldn't move. You could like any you'd have to really push, and it was very difficult. You'd come back up north, and you know they'd have the doors open, and you, you know you'd barely get any snow on the ice halfway through the period. So then you had to go. Okay, I can't like do too hard a push because I'll end up in the corner. So it was, there was more consistency as, as I progressed through my career. Cause, uh, but yeah, usually those go into those down. I remember, uh, I think I told the story, the, the, some rinks really humid, it would get foggy in there. Yeah. And, uh, and my, in Italy, my buddy went, he played on the other team. He went down to, he knew, uh, and I was playing, he always tried to score me, but he went down to the other end of the ice with the puck, and that's where he's going, and I heard him take a slap shot. So I couldn't see it, but I picked it up halfway (laughs) and stopped it. We had a chuckle after that, but yeah, it was uh, those open rinks in in certain parts of southern Germany. It got, like, just freezing cold. I looked down, I go, what's wrong with my jersey? It was actually frozen straight up just because of the wind and stuff. So, yeah, it was, uh, those were fun times for sure. What's a perfect ice for Kirk Martin? Like, what, what do you want? The ice? Is it yeah. a, too much curl, or do you want it to be straighter? Like, what, what no, do you yeah, want? I like lots of curl. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, Dad always made the ice himself, and he made it to curl lots. So, <laughs> six feet of curl. Cheating. Wow. Yeah, and <laughs> making the like, ice the nice and fast, yeah. like 14 and a half, 15 seconds is the kind of time, the hog to hog time, um, which is fast. So, fast and curly for sure. Huh? Where did he make the ice? At, like, uh, at the Dare, well, he originally at the Avenir Curling Club just down the street here. Mm-hmm. Um, when he was going to Nate, he made the he made the ice there. Um, my grandpa made the ice there, and his grandpa made the like oh, wow. my dad's grandpa. Did you make made the, the ice? ice? No, I, no, I, I, I've, I've helped out, but not to the point that they did. But uh, yeah, and then at, throughout his career, he made the ice at the Derrick all the time, and. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, he'd make his own sheet before he practiced every day, and I think he practiced every day. Like there, there was never a day off for him. Savile Center now, though, is he involved with the ice there? Uh, no, no, this was kind of yeah his own space. It's Derek's private club, and he could do his own thing by himself. And is there uh, still curling at the Derek Club? Mm-hmm. Yep, oh, there okay. currently. Yeah, yeah, yeah for I don't sure. Think it's going to too much longer. But. Yeah. No, I uh, yeah. <laughs> because well, my friend was a member there, and there was two memberships. You could be a golf or just a clubhouse. Everything else, yeah. Everything else, <laughs> Everything right? The clubhouse so, gets you the curling yeah. and stuff. Yeah. I don't, I, oh. I'm assuming so. Yeah, curling, swimming, yeah, everything. Swimming. I mean, yeah. they got everything there. Yeah, my, well, as kids, he, it was great because they just lived down the road and they would just go for the summers and, you know, you didn't have to worry about too much. But, no, I never saw the curling side of thing in there. You're yeah. on the hockey ice seven days a week, you were saying before. How much yeah. are in the ice at curling now? Yeah, seven days Is a it, week. It's uh, all ice. I, yeah, it's, yeah. I try to practice every day that we're not, um, not 
playing, but uh, maybe a rest day after an event, but that's about it. So, wow. yeah, it's, it's busy for sure. And that's a, a great point because, like, Car practices every day, but your teammates aren't here. You, yeah. Your teammates live in Calgary, Calgary and Winnipeg. And, and Winnipeg. So, and so, a kind of a two part question about how that works when you're not necessarily practicing together for the teamwork and cohesion. And then the other piece to that. Is I'm curious to talk a little bit about with Scotty's coming up. Rachel Holman lives in Edmonton. Yeah, she she's an Alberta girl now, and but she's skipping Ontario. With your team, you got two guys from BC on the team. One of your second skipped the BC team in the Briar a year ago, yeah. and so it's like. Who do the you know who to cheer for? Because, I mean, <laughs> Rach is wearing an Ontario jersey, but she lives in Edmonton. And, you know, your second skipped the BC team last year. So talk a little bit about that. Uh, both of those things. I'm curious about, again, how that teamwork works when you can't practice together. And then about how, you know, in the Briar and Scotties, where you know, players are playing for teams where they're not really from. Yeah, no, and I think I think it's like other sports. Like the Oilers don't have many players from Edmonton on it, um, but uh, you still have that. You wear that province, and all the fans cheer for you. But uh, yeah, like the three guys on my team aren't from Alberta. We got Cooey on Northwest Territories, and um, well, he's lived in Alberta for a long time. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, but yeah, still not from here. And, yeah, 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 and it's. But you, uh, yeah, you get on a team basically, and your province rallies around you, and that's that's what it's all about at the Briar. There's for sure. three Alberta teams in the Briar. Yeah. Go, who are we rallying around? Do you <laughs> still like you're going as wild card for this one? Do you still yeah. believe that you're an out team Alberta though, or yeah, it, it, does that not matter to you? Is with these changes that we've gone to the wild card teams and everything like that? Yeah, it's nice to represent Alberta. We'll have a lot of Alberta fans there, so I, I like that part of it. But at the same time, we just we want to have that maple leaf on our back. That's mm -hmm. that's the goal. So doesn't matter what we're wearing. We just want to get that maple leaf on our back and represent Canada. That's my favorite year is when Alberta's won it or a ring from Alberta. Absolutely. And now, like if you could get multiple wild card teams, we have so many rings there that yeah, we yes. can cheer from from Alberta because yeah, yeah. it's to me it's always Alberta first, no matter what. Every yeah. ring from Alberta, that's who I'm cheering for. Yeah. And, and, and game one of the Briar is Kevin Cooey against Luchinski. Yeah. The rematch. 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 I, I the can't wait for that else. already. Yeah. That's going to be exciting. Yeah, we can't wait either. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like the change of the two pools and not seeing everyone? Because like, it used to be, because yeah. now we've added none of it, and then we've we've added Team Can on the men's side. It was on the women's side for a long time, and you know all these wild card teams. Before, it was, you played everyone, and yeah. then it was the top four teams moved on. Do you like this format that it is now? I, I, I liked playing everyone, but yeah. my body likes splitting it up. It's a few less games. Mm -hmm. So um, with this many teams, it just isn't yeah. possible. Um, yeah, it could, if it went back down to 12 teams or whatever it is, I, I'd be okay with it and play everyone. That was a really cool. Um, it, it, it really felt like you're playing every province and it was, uh, yeah, national, a national event, but, uh, yeah, it's just, it's different. It keep, And it, I think it's changed every year I've played it. It's like nine in a row and it's changed every single year. So yeah, he, it's kind of interesting to see the, this year's take on it. And, uh, either way, I think throughout, regardless of the format, we've seen kind of the best four teams get to the top four spots and crims always going to rise to the top yeah so uh, yeah i don't think it really matters and it's good to switch it up too i love how like everyone's mic'd up and you can hear them talking and the strategy and everything mm -hmm. but is there any like trash talking in between teams <laughs> like we saw it's, oh, there's yeah. no morgan riley's out like <laughs> yeah. cross -check, but oh. is there someone like maybe you don't have to mention a name but is there someone that you're like oh i hate that guy oh yeah <laughs> there, there's yeah yeah there's definitely some of that most curlers they're really good people it's really good community but um yeah no there's some rivalries and there's definitely some of those guys you just want to beat for sure <laughs> no it, names though you're not gonna throw one out there no does it change you at all with the mic on 
Because it's not uh, every like, or you, do you wear a mic no matter what? Yeah, no, I, I usually have a mic on, and yeah. it ha- it's changed me just in life. I think, like I, I think <laughs> no I, more yeah, yeah, I haven't swore. You don't much want to, in want Taylor hearing yeah. you throw the f bomb. <laughs> yeah, to, yeah. So here. since I put a mic on, like I, I think just in general, I am always careful. So it, yeah, but um, I do really like that part of the sport that. We're always mic'd, and people really get to know the players. Mm. Oh yeah, and when you play like a Nash, like a Swedish team, they're obviously speaking Swedish and stuff, and yeah. they can they can understand. Is you? Is yeah. there? Is there any? Sometimes you talk about something maybe off strategy that they can hear and then put them on. I mean, I guess they see everything. Oh, but I've told Nick a couple of times, like, <laughs> can talk English. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, it, it, it's definitely an advantage for them. But yeah, uh, yeah you wonder sometimes what they're talking about. <laughs> yeah, they're they're pretty good about talking in English, especially when you get to the bigger events. So. Hmm. This is the ESD Angle presented by White Claw Hard Seltzer. There's always someone looking to ride the next wave. They're here for the ones who make their own White Claw. The difference is clear. Kark Martin from uh, Team Akui will be representing, well, Team Wildcard 3 at the upcoming Montana's Briar. <laughs> yeah, it's not the something. Tim Hortons Briar anymore. The Montana's Briar in a couple of weeks. Scotty's gets going tomorrow. Uh, we've got Murray McCourt. we got Joaquin Gage here. Uh, Mur- what's your connection with Karik here? Well, we've known each other... I'm going to say, I'm pushing 20 years. Yeah. Uh, so we all know that I was a GM of the junior hockey team. Eight-time champ. Eight, eight-time champ. Yeah. Yeah. So when I first moved to Edmonton, I got chased by several teams up here to run their programs. And I decided that I would. Uh, and so I uh, became the GM of the Beaumont Chiefs junior hockey team that had this uh, guy named Karak Martin on and I've always been a curling fan since I have knee high to a grasshopper and, and Kevin Martin was my favorite curler growing up so got the chance to meet and, and uh, work with with Karak and got a chance to meet and get to know Kevin which was a, a, a thrill for me as well and you know so we've all we've known each other for a long time but then coincidentally a couple of years ago I'm walking with my wife and my son to go pick up the mail and around the corner comes Karg, Brittany, and Kaylor, his son, who is one year older than my son, and it's like, Karg? Murray? <laughs> they moved in two oh, houses wait. down from us just across the street, and so, yeah, now we hang out all the time, and our kids get to play together, and, uh, well, you know, yeah. most Saturdays they, they come out to the golf course with us, we have dinner and wine while the kids can play golf, and, yeah, so, so we hang out a lot. It's a great little... Family uh, connection for the for the boys and for for us to get some adult time and the kids kids get to run off and have some fun because they're both only childs too so uh, you know it's great when they can get together and have some fun and then we all get some adult time. <laughs> yeah, I also see the ranch yeah. golf and country club well, sleep yeah. over there too. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, helping that's a connection. That's helping a connection support too. curling in this country. Yeah, well, absolutely, and, uh, and you know we support uh, Kark and the guys and. You know, I, I sometimes I'll get uh, text messages from people and say, you know, like, geez, I see, like, I'm watching curling right now and I see your logo on uh, on their uniforms. Like, is that really good advertising going on? I said, you're you texting text me it. right now. <laughs> you just <laughs> noticed it. Yeah, so if you notice it, sure as heck everybody uh, else notice it, uh, notices it as well. And that so, just proved it works. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, so it works, doesn't it? But, yeah, so it's great to support Karak and, and the boys and, I've always been a massive curling fan. I, I got to tell this story. Like my, my son is a sports junkie already and loves Karak. And and but my son is always and we're on this is we can say bad words. So I'm going to say my son is a little bit of a shit. <laughs> where his favorite hockey teams really are the Blackhawks, the Black Daddy, and and the Oilers. And big cowboy fan like me, but he always wants to cheer against my teams just. Because it, he wants to be a little shit. But when it comes to curling, he's not. Oh, okay. He is a fan. Yeah. And so the semifinal on Sunday morning? Yeah. Sunday yeah, morning. Sunday morning. We're watching it on YouTube on the big screen TV in the house. And it comes down to the last shot. Uh, it was like Kevin had to make a, like a kind of an angle raise takeout for two to win the game. I'm standing up beside... 
like <laughs> beside the couch. My son's standing on the coffee table beside me. He's throwing the rock, and my son will repeat what Kevin says. Like, and so like he's uh, uh, somebody yells like sweep car sweep, and so my son's like sweep it harder car sweep it harder car, <laughs> and I'm like come on, and I could tell by the calls that they were gonna make the shot. I'm like yes, he's gonna make it. He's gonna make it. my son screaming, and then he makes the shot, and my son and I are both jumping up and down and screaming, and we're high fiving and we're hugging, and it was just an incredible father-son moment. It was like one of the best moments, literally, of my life as a father to get to share such a fun moment with my kid. And so I yeah. sh- shared that with Karak after her, and he loves it because yeah. Kaylor's not really into <laughs> curling, and so he actually not really enjoys it. That, and Lucas, and yeah. so like, I'll send pictures or videos to Karak of my, my son like gets a, a curling broom out, and he'll be like pretending he's sweeping, and he'll be hollering, it's harder, Karak, harder! And be sweeping pretending he's He's him, and so it's, it's kind of cool and kind of fun. And but now I'm just got my fingers crossed, everything crossed <laughs> that my son will also have enjoyed that moment with me. And then when my Blackhawks are winning Stanley Cups again here in a couple of years, <laughs> that we'll be cheering loud together in the Cowboys and you know Oilers too. That we'll have more moments like that. But it was just a incredible father son moment. I loved it. It was incredible. Were you always into curling with your dad, or did it take no, a bit to get I, into it? No, I was the uh, I was like Kaler. So there's I, hope. Yeah, like, there's hope. I actually, um, I, yeah, I had quite the moment. I, I think we had won, uh, we won the province with the Chiefs, and was on Global News as Athlete of the Week. And I think I called curling a wussy sport. About, <laughs> I was like 17, probably then, or 18. Like, so it wasn't that long ago. And like, uh, as a GM, I know you weren't that. You were 19. Yeah, ni- so yeah, yeah, 19. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, it, it, so at 19, I still had. I was not a curling fan, and uh, actually, I was a more cute girl in kind of high school, first year university. Wanted to play on a mixed team, and me and a hockey buddy got together and played uh, mixed and all of a sudden we we were winning and then I played for the Golden Bears um, kind of snuck on to the last spot of the team and um, went to nationals that year and it just kind of snowballed oh, year yeah. after year but it was yeah it was almost the opposite against curling for a long time I still watched it and cheered dad on obviously but mm-hmm. not not to play it um, and but then uh, yeah to get to um, Go have like a, a drink after school or whatever with a couple of cute girls and a <laughs> hockey buddy and play some curling and that's how I got into it for sure. And, and his wife is the actual curler in the family. Yeah. Not not even though he's best in the world, his <laughs> wife's the curler of the family yeah. and and he met her through curling. curling. Yeah. yeah, which when curling sucked in your opinion at yeah. that time, but you know that's how he met his wife. <laughs> like, yeah. Oh no, so yeah, hilarious. the community is great. I I love the people I've taught all over the country and um, every every little farm community that you go to it's always a great great time going out to teach there have a banquet uh, oh, yeah. and all those type of things and you just meet a lot of great people throughout so I've always loved that part of it but I was always a hockey guy so uh, it, yeah it took a little bit longer to get me right into it, but it, it did kind of just snowball out of nothing, really. It all started with some friends on just kind of playing on Tuesday afternoon in a Which in was a Bocher, league. right? Uh, no, no, it was, it, 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 no, this was just a hockey buddy and a couple of cute girls. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, funny what cute girls can get oh, us guys yeah. to do, though, yeah. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> And look what it's created. <laughs> What's it like going to Barbie? Does it still, like... You're going to your number nine, you know, ninth yeah. appearance there. Is it still like, oh, my God, I'm at the Briar? Or like yeah. nine straight years, is it going to be kind of like, this is cool, but it, work time? No, yeah, the Briar <laughs> is, uh, it, it's it's this very special event. It's like in Regina, it'll be a packed house for sure oh, all yeah. week long. And got all, a lot of curling fans in Saskatchewan. And um, last time we played there, we, we were close, lost a final. I remember it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we want to get back there. It was a great event, and uh, yeah, no, it's kind of like the show. It's it's like the Grand Slams. You're playing on TV and stuff, and it, it, they have fairly good crowd and everything. But it's not saying the Briar is really in Canada, at least. When the, Vic the show, comes it's out, it's, no, yeah, it's yeah. exactly, well. and and uh, yeah, it's just a whole different atmosphere and. 
you get the blood pumping, and yeah, it's always great to be a part of. Yeah, Vic Router, that's it's iconic. It's the voice, right? It's the voice, yeah. Make it a final, yeah, you know, like yeah. all of that. It's just the yeah. best, and yeah. it's just like, as of tomorrow, we get that voice like multiple times for the Atlantic, like six weeks or whatever it is, yeah. between the Briars, the Scotties, <laughs> yeah, and the yeah. World Championships. It's <laughs> amazing. So, But I think like it's a little unfinished business for you with the new team, right? Yeah. Because you were with Botcher for a lot of years, had some great success. You know, the new Olympic cycle kicked in, and so you went with Cooey, and now the third on the team, I mean, he's the John going to be the John Morris of, like, he's so good. Yeah. And and then, you know, you just tinkered a little bit again last year with Jacques joining the team. He was a, the skip and the briar, learning a new position. Yeah. But, you know, how do you feel, like, where you're at right now and as a team and heading in? Like, are you, are you confident that... Uh, he, that unfinished business will get taken care of in a yeah, couple weeks? Yeah, we're throughout the season, we've grown quite a bit. Uh, like this last event, we, we didn't win, but we were playing as good as we have at all four positions. So, um, yeah, I think we're trending in the right direction. It is, it's a huge change for someone like Jack who skipped. Now he's sweeping and like he comes, he has to throw and he's huffing and puffing and <laughs> like it's, it's different. So uh, there's a little bit of a learning curve there for sure. Um, and then, yeah, they're, they're only 24, 25 years old, Tyler and Jack. So um, they, they still, they're so talented, but you get in these situations that they haven't been in, and it's, yeah. it's a new mm-hmm. thing. But gotta get that experience. And, and, all that. and our years kind of shown that. I think we've been in five finals, and um, we basically there've been feast or famine, and uh, and it kind of goes with that. Um, and I think the way things have trended through our, our tech, we're technically a lot better now, and. Um, Throw, like throwing the rock better and our systems have come together so hopefully we're peaking for the nice. briar that's all that's what are what, the differences between the positions then generally like, like obviously the skips making the calls yeah. and all that but like how, what is the differences between being lead to a second to a third and all that 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 we deal with the changes yeah like if for a lead you're sweeping like you throw your two rocks and then you're sweeping six in a row so um six in a row it's it's a ton of hard work and yeah. back to back to back and it just it, you especially in a briar where it's ten end games you're out there for three and a half four hours from start to finish and sweeping most of the time so it's it's yeah hard on the body and, um, and then yeah at skip for example like Kevin he he's just constantly thinking like you mm-hmm. can come off the ice and. You got the crowd just screaming, but you're just trying to think the whole time. <laughs> it's just like a migraine all the time kind of thing. So, um, yeah, there's a big difference between each position, and it's it's definitely not something you can just um, jump around and and be good at right away. Is there a game plan going into a match like of like like for Kevin especially of where he'd want to go with the start of that end, or does it? Like, is it end by end? He has to feel it by the game, or like, how, how do you guys go about deciding how? This end, we want to go play it. Yeah, no, there's definitely a game plan. There's an end plan. So every end, you have a plan. Um, and and the skips are different. Like uh, Brendan, for example, is a lot more defensive um, mm-hmm. when I played with him. And Kevin's, like, ultra-aggressive. Um, one thing I love playing with Kevin because it's just always exciting. Like <laughs> win or lose, it's you're always in it. Like you're there's a ton of rocks in play and um, and teams get yeah. cooed yeah. all the time. <laughs> yeah. The shots that this guy can can make, right? Yeah, it's like crazy. he just loads up the house and makes these amazing shots, and it's exciting for the fans. It's exciting for for us even, and and uh, yeah, it's. I, I do really enjoy that part, but yeah, Kev has a plan that he's gonna put a lot of pressure on teams, and uh, if it comes down to him having to make a really tough shot, he's gonna make it. He wow. goes with that heavy shot sometimes. Does that ever worry that you're gonna have to be huffing it down the ice? You know, I, I know it's coming. Like <laughs> that's what I train for. Like it's coming because really, he will send a missile down that yeah. rink. And sometimes, like he has like his normal missile, but then like the odd time, he won't tell us, and it'll be like really hard and <laughs> you just start running basically so yeah. let's go back to the practice thing because you know we you alluded to the oilers or but they're all here in edmonton right now and they're practicing together every single day yeah. you're in edmonton 
They're in Calgary, so you're practicing with Rachel Holman, a nice person to practice with, uh, but she's not Kevin Cooey. And, and Rachel's here, and her team's in Ontario. So not getting to practice with your team on a, a, you know, a daily basis, like how, how does that impact you know, the cohesiveness when you do get together and play in events like the Briar? Yeah, I know. There's definitely a difference. Uh, it, it, I, I like for a long time. Brad, Brandon were here. Darren was only 45 minutes down the road. We got to practice every day together, and I think that's part of what made that team so great. Um, now w- we have four really talented guys, but uh, yeah, I got to travel to Calgary quite a bit, or they come up here, and um, you just got to work a lot harder to make sure you get that t- those team practices in. Um, Jock out in Winnipeg, he's basically just lived in Calgary. Like mm. <laughs> he, he goes home for a week every couple months, kind of thing. Um, so, so uh, yeah. Without you, gotta at this level, you gotta be practicing together. And then uh, we also take advantage of video. Like uh, our national coach, uh, one of them, Scott Pfeiffer, he'll come out and um, take video of me go down to Calgary with my video and compare mm-hmm. each other's videos to make sure we're all throwing it similar. Um, so we definitely use our, that to our advantage too when we can't get together. So when you look at video, what are you, what are you breaking down? Release points or? Yes, what? slide line, release points, how like the uh, rotation. Um, but slide line's a big one, just uh, making sure we're all throwing at the same angle of attack oh, okay. and uh, yeah, and you really want your rocks reacting as similar as possible. Um, and we have a lefty on the team, so then uh-huh. it even okay. really switches things up. We try to all get closer together, even though one's thrown from the left hack, one's thrown from the right hack. So, hmm. um, yeah, you're using there's a lot there's a lot of technical that goes into a curling delivery okay. for sure. Do you think incredible science just overall in sports? Yeah. Like, yeah. even for you as a goalie, like, what you had to deal with when you were playing to what they have now available to them oh, it's, is just night and day. Yeah. Well, just breaking down. and I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a huge fan of iPads on the bench. I think, yeah. I think players should be more engaged with during the game, the game and, and reading what's happening right then and now. In between periods, fine. To go like that's what happened. Guys would go to the video room and and look at things at that point. But I think you become disengaged when you're looking stuff on the. You're thinking about something. You know mm-hmm. what had happened there. You stay focused in the. That should in happen the moment. in between periods or yeah. in between games. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just the the instant like feedback you can get now is is crazy what you can do. So yeah, I'm sure curling when you just seeing the breakdown of everything that's uh yeah that's yeah. fascinating because it's it's hard to throw a rock it's very hard <laughs> well it's hard to do yeah, sports you, at a high level yeah, yeah, yeah. But, yeah. well it, with and with all the olympic funding that comes to it like you you're getting all kinds of um like blood or and air um, oh, testing yeah. all over you and oh. rock, we have rock throwing machines that'll throw the rock the exact same every time so we can test sweeping and oh, so um, it's like those football man. machines that just yeah, released the ball yeah <laughs> that's pretty yeah. cool that yeah. Is, yeah. that's they, really they, awesome yeah they have the same velocity and the same rotation on every single shot so you oh. can test different things out and it, the technology just never ends like no you, you, and and the best part now i think about the technology is a lot of it is much more mobile than it used to be so you can kind of do it anywhere where you used to have to go to a certain training center to do that mm-hmm. now they can bring it to you wherever you are so um, you're just constantly it's just getting more technical and people get more precise and you're seeing it in the way people the curlers are playing now it's like the shots that they're playing you're are just things that were really tough before just everyone has to be good yeah. at now <laughs> can you imagine going on film on a course marie of your shot well yeah it's the same thing that Gage well, was saying. Like, you don't want to see definite, it in the middle of your game i don't think I mean, i've ever seen a golfer anyone do that like oh, on the range all the time it, you know yeah, but like sure. you're around like it's not something that is you golf it's your rounds if you need to work on anything yeah. like even at the highest level still it's go to the range and deal with it there yeah it's never during yeah and like but 
like a, a good buddy of mine used to be an assistant pro with the ranch, Jeff Tell is his mm-hmm. name. He, great teacher. And he really knows my game in, inside out. And so if I'm ever struggling, I'm like, Telly, when are you going to be in town? And he'll just grab his phone, go behind me, because typically my uh, a mistake I'll make is I'll bring the club back a little too far inside. Talking about, you know, him and, and the rocks and the delivery point and stuff. So I don't feel it. I feel like I'm where I need mm-hmm. to be. And then he'll just get there on his phone, and I'll go look at the video like, oh, okay. So <laughs> then get it, take it back where I need to be taking it back, and then he'll show me the video, and I'm hitting it good, and it's like, oh, easy fix, but you just don't feel it yourself. You need to see it sometimes, right? And, yeah, it's that that video can be very helpful. But in the middle of a game, you can't be messing around with that in the middle of a game because you gotta you got to play the game. Yeah. I hate those things at golf to where they – Show you your swing because I think I'm Freddie Couples out there. I think, <laughs> I think it's sweet as sugar, no. but it's not. <laughs> Freddie's got a pretty good swing. I, I saw him I, I, when I played junior uh, in Portland. I uh, I saw the uh, Fred Meyer Classic. Me and a couple guys went and watched, and Davis Love and Freddie were there, and they were crushing the ball. And they were two of just sweet swings, and they were talking afterwards. So oh, you're hitting the ball so far. He goes, yeah, well, I could hit it a lot further, but I'm trying to tone down my swing a bit. Freddie was, it, it was great to see him. He that's when he, had, I think he just won the Masters at that point. So he was at the top of his game at that point. It was, it was Supposed great. to be just an incredible guy too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, he was very engaging. Mm-hmm. It seemed like he was very vocal with people. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, I bet. Yeah. Seniors tour goes down through Calgary. Every year, oh, does it's it? Sure does. He's classic. There, right? and, yeah. But it's great because it's like the old golfers I grew up watching that are yeah. all now there, and it's just it's just the it's best. Gr- it's the best. And just watch yeah. them still do. Yeah. And VJ's there, and it's all. John yeah. Daly's been doing the last couple of years again. It's yeah. it's a lot of fun. So and it can just be about, a fun week. Talk about smoking and drinking and everything <laughs> on <laughs> <laughs> while you're playing your sport. <laughs> he still does that. Never, he'll never change. Uh, Scotty's this weekend. You got any? Analysis of who might come out or how they're playing, or you've been so focused on the men's side and the Briar coming up. Well, he, the way Rachel's played all year yeah. this year, and uh, being an Edmonton girl, I got to be cheering for Rachel. Um, yeah, no, it's even though your it, teammate's girlfriend is yeah. representing Alberta. Yeah, well, I, and it's their first go in Team Sturme. So, uh, like you said, Alberta, you're always cheering for Alberta. But uh, Rachel's a good friend, and they've had a couple tough uh, results in the last couple of Scotties. I think it's their year, for sure. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. I would I love that. Th- I think it's a It also, happen, like, yeah. with all due respect, it'd be nice for a change in the guard. Get a different winner on the women's side, finally. Well, yeah. you know, I didn't like, know this, but we were talking about before. <coughs> Jennifer Jones is retiring. Yes. I talk about yeah. changing the guard. Wow, mm-hmm. that's big news. Yeah. That, well, wouldn't that be special if she won her last one? Yeah. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, that would be an amazing. Yeah, that, that's got an a amazing chance. Yeah. She's third ranked cur- yeah. uh, team in the world. Oh, so. she, she's always got a chance. Like, cool yeah. bet odds have her, I think, as third best odds. Yeah. Third I best think best. it was Rachel Holman. I think it was Team Can. I think it was yeah. Team well, Jones. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but Rachel's, Rachel's. Anderson's rank has just been so is good. Is it Anderson yeah. or Ironson? Everyone uh, says it different. I say Ironson. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I think, though, I think Rachel's going to get it. She's just been so good this year. Yeah. yeah, and she's from from Edmonton. We gotta plug her. Just she never wanted to play in the Alberta Playdowns. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was, and I understood why, and I respect it. I respect yeah. going to Ontario. That's where you're from, and going for it there. I always respected that. But it was well, like, the rest of her come play for Alberta. Alberta. <laughs> Represent Alberta. Wear the Alberta jacket. The rest of her team is all there, though. Yeah. So. But she, they had the ability to play for Alberta. Yeah, last year, yeah. Joanne Courtney and Sarah Wilkes and they her were all from criteria. Alberta. They not anymore, but they, well, they, at they that did. team. Yeah, that yeah. team did. For What's sure. the criteria? Uh, you need three from Alberta. Okay. And yeah. it's either born there born or there. living there. Oh, yeah, yeah, living there. Yeah. So like, they had the two, the people living here and stuff. So they check boxes. So and people, why she can still move, play in Ontario. People move a lot. Yeah. yeah. Curling, yeah. Just so they can, yeah. But, yeah need so. a mailing address in some <laughs> province. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So here's, here's another thing in, in curling I want to talk about a little bit. that In hockey, in international hockey, when overtime happens and then there becomes a, a shootout, it's not real hockey anymore. It's kind of exciting, but it's kind of silly way to end the game. Now, in curling this year, oh, tiebreakers. But like, I've had so many texts with Kark this year. Like, are you guys in or out? Like, well, this is so ridiculous because before the bond spill even starts, everyone throws a few rocks or something and it's closest to the button, and so they have that. And then now they go play uh, however many games they play, and then there's tiebreakers and. The tiebreaker is how close somebody throws it 
to the right. And so one time they show this list on the TV, and there's 24 teams in the tournament, and they're like third best, like four inches or something away. And then the other teams they're tied with, two of them were the teams that were closer than four inches, and... I'm just like, what the heck is this? How are you guys getting beat out? And is it not ridiculous, or is it just me because it's you guys? And I'm, I'm. No, it's it, you're a big supporter. Uh, I guess we just we we've always liked playing for it. Uh, this is a newer thing. We there always used to be tiebreaker games, uh, and the first half of this year there was, they took draw to the button distances after each game, and the cumulative draws ended up being the tiebreaker. Oh really? Uh, and we'd rather play for it, like yeah. even a shorter yeah. game. Could you do like? Could you do a five end yeah. game, a six end game? Does that make any yeah. sense? But I mean, that's just you guys were getting hose bagged. Yeah, and yeah, we had a rough go. We, I think we lost <laughs> three. by point three, like point two centimeters, and then by three centimeters. Oh, it's two of them. oh okay. Uh, and like that's just too little of a difference yeah. with only four games. So uh, three bond spiels, they got hose bagged this way we from going into the into the quarterfinals yeah, this year. We finished ninth, yeah, uh, in top eight qualify, and finished ninth in the first three Sweet. slams of the year. Like, so, oh, yeah, it's a bit of a rough go that way, but we we did have a good year otherwise. And uh, but in Red Deer, they did change it back to tiebreakers because I think they they got a lot of feedback from it uh, so yeah, we, you yeah. won you yeah. won Red Deer perfect <laughs> where he's got, he got his egg. got his point mate oh. yeah. <laughs> now, you, now you work on the weather network and get that figured out you've got everything I got, going I got a little beef here a little beef there and I'll we'll, we'll work on them slowly but surely not that I have any say in this I can just bitch the car about yeah, it yeah. but you got a platform no, now, right? Yeah, yeah, we're hearing about it from all the fans, though, and I, I think it is confusing. So, yeah, uh, well, yeah, yeah, exactly. There's no structure to yeah. to it, and as you just don't know what's there's just ah, yeah, play, play, just like don't <laughs> just play. you play hockey it, it, it in Europe? Be, How it, dumb is it for you as a goalie to get uh, get a shootout uh, uh, ending? You know, an important game instead it's of just playing It's good when you win. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, uh, do you feel as good about it though as if it's uh, a win's a win? Probably, it's, isn't it? It was. It's it's so part of the culture there. Yeah. yeah. So it's expected, right? But when to me, it's a it's a skills competition, right? End, right. Yeah. So where, where the goalie is left was, hanging out to dry. It was brutal because yeah, um, there was times when I would lose, and I was. A, I was the, probably the be- I was the better goalie in the game, right? And kept my team in it, and we got back. Or and then uh, and then to lose on a on a shootout, it was yeah. just it was it doesn't re- feel right. No, it, it sucked. It sucked. I would much rather just play yeah. over time, and, and, yeah. and it probably doesn't feel right to no, you. No, you, you, you want to like, play, and you want to you want to win. Especially like you said, you're in, you know you're the better team, yeah. And then you lose to someone on a skills competition, yeah. Yeah, you want to win because you're the better team. Yeah. It's fascinating because that's not a, like in soccer. I think most people are okay with the, the penalty kicks to end because of how long, like it just uh, how much the body's gone through. You can only make so many substitutions that if you're still tied after a 90 minute match plus 30 minutes of extra, let's just get to the penalty kicks. And we had France Argentina World Cup final, and it was just like this was great. Everyone's like, no one was saying ah, I shouldn't have ended in penalty kicks. Uh, and it's just such a different would've... for the sport. Like it, I know, but it was it was. I mean, that was. They're different gonna, the, the, at the last World Cup, but I would have enjoyed Italy them to won still a World play. Cup against France in a penalty yeah. kicks, and I'm <laughs> more than okay with that. <laughs> but sorry, Matawanek. Sorry, Lieutenant Eric, wherever you are. I would have already fallen asleep long before the penalty <laughs> kicks because soccer is like watching the wall. Tell that to the billion people plus that watch the World Cup final, Murray. Uh, <laughs> billion people plus. I, I ended up watching a, li- a little bit at the end too because I don't know. See, I think sucked I sucked you in. I was brought you in. Messi my, versus Mbappe. My dad, my wife's dad is from France, so he's a big soccer guy, and he wanted it on the TV. I'm like, okay, fine, but give me a, gla- <laughs> give me a glass of wine so I can tolerate watching it. I need a glass of wine to... It was like at 9 in the morning, Murray. Well, maybe I'm thinking of a different soccer thing, because I haven't watched much soccer in my life, because it's not very exciting. It's like like Gager wa- wanting to sit on the side of the hand day and watch cars go by. It's the same thing as watching those silly car races. Some people say that about golf and watching Tiger at the Genesis. Well... <laughs> 
Okay, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I know golf's not the most exciting game uh, to watch either. But how exciting it was it for Nick more. Taylor to win? Yeah, uh, was, okay, so we were at the yeah. Central Casino Sports Bar and Lounge. Yeah, and obviously we we're there for the Super Bowl, so all the TVs were in Super Bowl. I had it on my phone, and I was more focused on the golf. And then eventually we got Renee from Central Casino to throw it up on the TV. And when Nick Taylor nailed that winning putt, yeah. big cheer big from half of the room. <laughs> exactly. The other half of the room going, what are you guys cheering about? We're like, ah, Nick Taylor, he just made it. We yeah. won. So I think when I was on the Hangout last before, I, I said, like, I'm not really that interested in this Super Bowl. This wasn't a very engaging game to me. I didn't even check the score of the game until it was in the third quarter. Because my day was focused on golf and curling. So I'm <laughs> in the basement at my uh, my wife's parents' house and have the golf on the TV and I have the curling on my phone <laughs> and a glass of wine beside me. I mean, this was a pretty good day except for the fact that I was getting angry that you know, there was a struggle <laughs> in the final. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, you know, it was that's I didn't care about the Super Bowl. It was well, and was the golf, golf went and almost to halftime. Yeah, it went because of the delays, the frost delays, everything that was going on, having to finish the third round and play the final mm-hmm. round on the Sunday. That by the time Nick Taylor won, and that was playoff, obviously, mm-hmm. it it went almost to halftime. right. And so that's where it was uh, that's when I finally checked yeah. the score. I'm like, oh, it's three nothing, whatever, like boring. But I did turn the football game on for the last five minutes when I f- saw my phone. It was pretty good. Oh, Tom, we're gonna G make a swap. House. You guys can get into some hockey talk now, especially. Oh, oh. Uh, hey, Tom. Yeah, nice to meet you. We'll switch. There. Are you good? Yeah, yeah you got emails this. to send. <laughs> I'm yeah. not working. Get to work. Get to work. Okay. All, right. All right, continue. I'm here. So, to what are they gonna do about the waste management now? What kind of kind of regulations would, wow. would Murray come up with now? You know, what do you waste, need? Regulations is great. <laughs> yeah, like the waste management is just a different beast, Be, right? Yeah. And it's it's just not normal. And I think the players, for the most part, they know that and they get it. I mean, there was that one little argument between a player. Yeah. And I'm like, man, read the room. Look where you are. But I don't know. I, I I, I think maybe the waste management got a little bit big. They need to rein it in a little bit to control it. Maybe the number of people that are in or something. I, I don't know. But it's the waste management. It's yeah, just okay. different. You gotta, you gotta let the waste management be the waste management. If the players can't handle that, then don't go. Don't go. There's lots of, there's lots of other guys in the lineup to go and participate yeah. and be, be part of that atmosphere. And if you don't want to be, then well, yeah. I thought it was fantastic. And there's a lot of non-golf fans. That were tuning into it just because of all the yeah. right because the show yeah. yeah you know there was this one scene we'll probably probably you guys will remember there's a a scene of about maybe ten or twelve guys in the stands none of them have shirts on and they probably most of them probably should have had shirts on <laughs> and like Sean their head pro when we were seeing this the other day he was saying he said I bet you none of those guys have ever held a golf club in their life they're just yeah. there getting hammered because it's the place to be the th- the thing to do. Yeah, and you know, well, good for them. I mean, they're getting exposed yeah. to the game, and yeah, yeah, it's just it's just fun. I mean, it's sixteen, right? The whole yeah, sixteen. Yeah, like, all 16. Yeah. like when guys knock it, sti- like it's great. No. It's that what a I I love it. I I think it's great. It. I, I don't like the the guys like stumbling and barely able to function. Well, but. That happens at NHL games. <laughs> Every guess. single order game, there's yeah, a handful yeah. of guys there that no. Uh, yeah, it's probably no, been you never. a time or two, Tommy G. I, I have not gone to an games. Oilers game. Well, actually, after I was, my time came up with Oilers TV, there was like a three-week window before I started at TSN. I did go to a game as a fan for the first time. It was weird. Yeah, well, Elks games, though. Elks, oh, Elks well, games, hey. that's a little different. Especially when I get to sit in your seats. Yeah, well, fair. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I was, uh, well, at the last game, I was leaving, and after the game, and I went to, I had to go to the washroom told Tommy this. It was so funny. Oh, yeah. Like the guys, everyone's pretty greased at that point. But the guy beside me was swaying and uh, relieving himself. And he, was oh, so, no. he was just so funny. He goes, he was looking and he just goes, this is an $800 pee. <laughs> like, <laughs> he blew 800 bucks on booze at the game. I was just, it was so funny. But yeah, that's, uh, I guess you're right. At that time of night, I'm surprised how inebriated people are at hockey games because you know that wasn't cheap, whatever they did. Well, that wasn't well, cheap at all. Yeah. What? Okay, since we're talking hockey and golf here and, and spectator prices and stuff like that, like if this guy's spending 800 bucks, and that was funny when you came on the post-game show the <laughs> other night, and you're like, $800 piss, this guy's taking, he's complaining about it. 
people complain about the prices, right? Like for the food and, and especially the drinks. But they pay, they pay it. it. Yeah. They pay yeah. it. And then same with yeah. Waste Management Open. Like, it's not cheap to get into there. The prices for drinks are probably super expensive. You're seeing, like, people just throw in their drinks if there's a hole-in-one <laughs> on 16. And you're going, man, like, don't complain about it then. Yeah. If, if, if you're going to gonna foot the bill, then yeah. it is what it is. But then you're going to enjoy it. I may as well, I suppose. Yeah. Although, the, I'm sure, like... You can get pretty primed up before you get to the golf course down there for cheap, especially sure, yeah. in the U.S. And then here, like, there's so many spots where yeah. you can get cheap drinks right around the arena. Or before. at home before you go. Or, <laughs> yeah. or at home. Yeah. You can buy a 6 o'clock or longer four-pack for, like, four, well, fourteen ninety nine at I mean, Sobeys and Safeway Liquor. Who, who hasn't taken a bottle of Coke, dumped a quarter of it out, filled it up with whiskey, shook it up, and you're, th- you're carrying a bottle of Coke. You're not drinking, but you're drinking, and, yeah. it's, and it's cheap. So everyone's done that. I remember old Rexall going to games as a fan and the guy came in huge north face jacket right he came in with his buddies sat down and i saw him he was just going into his and it was the molson canadian camp tall boys that you could buy there right. so it didn't look bad but he must have had at least 24 beers in that jacket come on oh wow. he just kept going like this and they just kept coming out and i was like oh then they got the uh, metal detector yeah, so that, then it all changed <laughs> yeah it all changed yeah. but the briar patch that's a Mm, yeah, that's crazy. Legendary. That's a great time, and <laughs> yeah, it looks like in Regina they got some good acts. I think the rec laws start first night, so it'll be a, it'll be a big party in Regina for oh, sure. That was great. Do I, you indulge in some of that, yeah, or are you guys have. just focused on oh. playing and you're going to bed early? Oh, it's Team Cooey, we'll make it down once or twice. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, Kevin in particular <laughs> yeah. is not going to miss a good party, I don't think. Yeah, no, the Cooey's. Uh, it, it's it really good for the fans to be able to see. Uh, uh, the players and just be around the yeah. players and it brings more people to the event and it, it, yeah it adds to the party so we want to be part of that and if, grow the game but also though when you're there you work yeah you're, he he has he does his job he's cr- curling all over the planet but he does his work his yeah. job uh while he's curling in between games you'll see him putting in some time at work so <laughs> yeah and, so he'll be doing that in the briar too right yeah he'll get some work in there yeah it's a it's always just a yeah just a busy busy yeah. kind of circus going briar, on. briar patch my first introduction to it, i think oh four the briar was here somewhere around there Right, I think. And it was a little later, but was it 04? 04, 05 oh, oh, Somewhere in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, I, I was the, at the old Sport X, which is I think since been torn down at Northlands. They had the Briar Patch there, and I was like, "What is this?" Like I've known the Briar for years, yeah. and, uh, and people are like, "This is a lot of fun." Think of the CFL Great Cup parties. And I was like, "I like that," and uh, the patch was amazing. I think I went like two or three times, yeah, and just just wild. But everyone's very friendly family. there too. Yeah, like a CFL Great Cup event. Like that's the vibe I get. Is that a fair yeah. equation? Yeah, it's like I've said. It's really the community of curling. There, everyone's friendly and. Um, yeah, you get a lot of redneck kind of party going on. And <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, no, and it's a great time for right sure. Right up Tommy Gazzola's alley. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was a time. This was what, like, oh, man, like almost 20 years ago. So. There, there was a time? There was a time. <laughs> Tommy, don't you can lie to your friends and I'll lie to my friends, but let's not bullshit each other here. I mean, we the know that there's not many parties that you're going to miss out on. I, I it loved happens. it because it was on the big screens in the in the Briar Patch too. So every like I was in the stadium watching, and everyone's pretty focused. Yeah, and it's it's pretty quiet, and it's but then you go to the Briar Patch, and everyone's like, oh, yes, yeah. like it was yeah, yeah one of the best uh, sporting events. I've ever been to. You know what's fascinating too about watching curling live, like when you're, say, at Rogers Place or, you know, a big venue, there's four games going on at once. Mm-hmm. If you're watching a hockey game or a football game, you're watching one game. Yeah. Like, it's, I, I found it difficult to know where to watch and where to look. I mean, if you're playing, obviously I'm focused on your game, but then all of a sudden you hear this big roar, like, ah, oh, what, what have I missed? <laughs> yeah. What's going on over there? It's it's, it's kind of hard to keep track of everything that's going on at the same time with four games. Is that, yeah. like, kind of... Is that disruptive when other teams are playing beside you and stuff? Well, how do you, or you just lock it out? You, you get, you don't notice it anymore. But yeah. yeah, like my first prior, first couple of Grand Slams, like yeah, when 
say Jacobs or Gushu or someone makes a huge shot and the crowd goes wild, then you're, kind of, you're yeah. hearing it, but not anymore. Okay. Like, yeah, you, you don't even notice anyone else out there. Yeah, you're also playing with Kevin Cooey, who gets gets the fair hit, share. He gets his fair oh, share okay. of roars because yeah, yeah. he makes some shots that <laughs> yeah. you yeah. just don't see. Yeah, I, yeah, I'd find that. Well, especially when you're first, like your first briar, yeah. you're seeing some of the, the the top names in the sport. It's like I remember my first game and seeing like Sergey Fedorov. You know, you're like, oh my god, look at Sergey. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. Just he's get bearing kind of... down on you about to snipe top shelf. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> just, wow, that was a great shot. <laughs> 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 but uh, no, I, yeah, I, I'm sure it's a little jarring. If, but then it's kind of. Yeah, then it's normal. As usual, right? Yeah. yeah. Man, that's cool. So, uh, for you, though, is that okay? So you're out there against, or, you know, whoever, and you kind of in awe of, of your surroundings early in your career? Or yeah. Like, what was that like? For sure. I mean, the the first time you play, like, first game was against the Leafs and, um, like, Gilmore and, and Sundin. And, and, you know, at first, like, the, the face-offs in your and you see these guys, you're like, oh, my gosh. Look who I'm playing against right now, and then you're like, okay, I got to make sure they don't score. But um, it, I think it, it took a few games, like because every game you get out there, you see the first of all, you see the uniform, and I my favorite uniform is the Detroit Red Wings. Like I think it's the best looking under Cla- the last. Classic, classic. It, it's yeah. gorgeous, man, and. And uh, so that's a little jarring that you see the the red wing on there, and then you see the the arc names on the back, you know. And so you're kind of you got to pinch yourself a little bit. I think everyone's a little starstruck at the beginning, but then you get kind of you start hating a guy because he's bumped you or something. I go. So I want this to relate to you, but let's just use the Detroit Edmonton game the other day. A young goalie started the game in, uh, for Detroit gets hurt, but. Look, now, I'm just thinking, like you mentioned Gilmore, Sundin. So that young goalie, Connor McDavid's bearing down on him, and he stops it or whatever. Uh, you know, Warren Fogle bears down on himself. So, okay, Warren Fogle, not anything. You know what I'm saying? So, yeah. I mean, in those moments for you, when a Matt Sundin or a Gilmore comes down versus, you know, whoever a third, fourth liner guy is, like when you stop a Connor McDavid as a young goalie right now, or a Sundin in your, in your case, like, are you like, Oh my God! I just stopped the puck from my. <laughs> <laughs> or are you just laser focused um, that it doesn't? No, yeah. at that point you're kind of fo- focused. You might like, you know, if you a rebound comes and you've smothered it up and you look up and the, there's all these faces that you've seen on TV before. That's yeah. that's always it's a cool moment, right? Yeah. And I think more so like stopping as a goalie anyway. For me, I just remembered because you know you're always okay. I'm at the I'm at the pinnacle now. Um, do I belong here? You know, I, am I good? Am I really good enough? And I always think I am, but, uh, but then, you know, if you do stop one of those guys, oh yeah, I belong here. No big, no big, I belong here now. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That's kind of what, what, uh, what happened with me. It wasn't, uh, some of those guys, I mean, everyone's so much different. I remember Wendell Clark, I played against him and just had a, his, I, he wasn't the fastest skater. But from like here to there, he was lightning. Like his, <laughs> the way he could move and his wrist shot was just a sledgehammer. And I remember because uh, he came down and stopped and jumped to the middle and took a quick little wrist shot. And I, I remember I was like, man, that's coming fast. I go, oh, it's, it's going to hit me. And it hit me in the knee. But you know when you go to the doctor, he does a reflex test. Right? <laughs> so it hit me right in between like my knee <laughs> and really? my leg just went. <laughs> like you're wow. just, yeah, like I was like, oh my god, yeah, this uh, you're not in a, you're not in Kansas anymore, Dorothy, with wow. these guys. So there was just like um, who was it? Some moments, well, Sergey was crazy because he, when he skated, it looked like his butt was about this far off the ice, like he was just so low and just like cruising. One of the greatest skaters that I really saw up close was Pat Lafontaine. Mm. We played against him in when in Buffalo. And it just seemed like he, it, he gained speed on corners. Like he was, he, it was like a train. Mm-hmm. It was, he, he was on rails everywhere. What just effortless. Player, yeah, yes. just, so 
and I was playing against Hashik at the other end that night. Nibble mm-hmm. Buffalo Odd, like that was <laughs> that was a pretty cool game. What a match! Joaquin Gage against Dominic Hess <laughs> yeah. in the bright lights. Well, if you the game where they showed Doug Waite, where he does he has him completely out of his jock strap and Hashik throws back the glove and stops it. I, I was at game. the other. I was at the other end. Game. I was <laughs> like, damn it! <laughs> <laughs> you ever get in a goalie scrap? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> A junior, uh, actually, a, I think he's a, he was a, with the Edmonton Police, uh, Scott Bailey. Um, I fought him in junior. Uh, there's another guy in junior I fought too. Did not pro. Pro was a. Uh, Didn't you pro. beat up a like a rookie? In well, Sweden? in Sweden, yeah, I, I beat up. I, I, <laughs> he was bigger than me though, but uh, I beat him up. I, I, I uh, yeah, that's a whole story. <laughs> Tell it. Oh god! It is good because there's an old lady on the subway involved. So, in this. oh my goodness! Yeah. we were there's a you know um, this big circle bread that you see in stores. It's Lexan bread. Okay. There's a town called Lexan in Sweden. That's where that bread actually comes from. So, and they're our derby game with us in Urgarden. So that uh, the rink where the Leafs were playing in the in the Sweden game. That's where I played. Okay. So the rink's packed, going nuts. <laughs> And uh, they were, I got run over like three times. They don't protect the goalies in Sweden at all. <laughs> Fair game. So I had enough, get into a fight with a guy and uh, did well. And the, uh, the, I go into the room. And the a next, rookie. Yeah, well, I didn't know this till the next day. Okay. And then, uh, so the next, the, everyone said, oh, you're suspended the rest of the, We had three games left in the regular season. And then, you're, you're done. You might as well just go home. I'm like, oh, my gosh. So the next day, um, I didn't have a car. I just took the tunnel bonnet to, to the rink. And so I'm, and the, those little metro newspapers or whatever. So I get on the, get on the train and I'm sitting there and I look up and everyone's got these little metro newspapers. And it's my face punching this kid. And it said in Swedish, like, Crazy Canadian goaltender, oh. uh, and I was like, I look and I go, oh my god! So I bury my 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 head in my hands, and and I look up, and there's this little old Swedish lady sitting across from me on the on the train, and she goes, she goes, looks looks at me, looks back at the paper, looks at me, and got up and left. <laughs> oh she my saw goodness! It was me, but I only got three games. But uh, yeah, that was uh, that was pretty funny. Oh wow. <laughs> You know, when I was on the Hangout last time, I told a story afterwards that kind of reminded me of this uh, story a little bit, but it got a good, a good laugh, everyone, so I'll, I'll share it. Is when I played hockey, I was a rough guy. I, you know, <laughs> I was going in the corner, and only one of us was going to come out. Perfect. And yeah, that was the kind of player, player I was. But I always hated it when people held my stick. Oh. Just hated it. So we're playing this... Uh, this game and this person's holding my stick and I get really angry and I throw them down the ground and I just get on top of them and two really, like, this is midget, so I had cages on, but just two, as hard as I could, just bam, bam, right in the face. So I get two minutes for roughing it. One of my teammates was in the penalty box. So I get escorted to the penalty box, get in, and I said to my teammate, boy, did I ever land two bombs on that guy. Like, I really gave it to that guy. And the guy holding the gate, uh, working the penalty box, says, what do you mean that guy? You just punched a girl no. in the face twice. And I'm like, what? And I'm like, no. And so I just pumped this girl twice in the face. I had no idea it was a girl. But I felt like this big. Like, are you kidding me? I just did that. But... Oh yeah. man, I was so embarrassed no, at that terrible. moment. Eat a battle. Yeah. Yeah. I, that was a I while well, holding the stick, it was a great play by Connor. The on uh, Bouchard's goal. You could see it. And Cider went nuts afterwards, yeah. right? Because that that's accidentally on purpose, just holding the player stick. You see that a lot more from Connor. Taking playing on the edge with the uh, with penalty calls, but great play. Like because he couldn't see it. But it made it look like Cider was trying to trying to hold them back, which is good. Uh, it's the ESC Hangout presented by White Claw. Tom Gazzola from Matty Awanek, who I think he's sending emails right now. <laughs> he's like, i got a ton of stuff to get to. Waukee uh, <laughs> yeah. Gage, uh, Murray McCourt, and Kark Martin. And uh, Kark, we have a question via the nasty chat. It's from Fish Tank. There's some great names in there. <laughs> Fish Tank says, Tommy, can you ask Kark about sponsorships and if he's able to be a full-time professional curler and how common that is? 
Great question. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're great. we have some great sponsors that uh, but that help us uh, pay our way to all these events. The ranch. Um, yeah, <laughs> including the, the ranch. ranch. Yeah, 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 the ranch for sure. Um, but, yeah, no, we still all work in Canada. Canada, U.S., most of the teams work um, full-time. Like I, I work full-time for the government of Alberta. Um, but... The European teams and uh, Asian teams, they're almost all full-time curlers. So it's, uh, yeah, not quite a level playing field that way. They're training eight hours a day. We're trying to fit a practice in whenever it's possible between uh, work and family and everything else. Is that, like, government funding for those European teams? Is that where that money's coming from? It's like, hey, this is your job now? Yeah, now that it's Olympic sport, um, Olympic medals are so important to the countries. Um most countries don't have a ton of depth, but they'll have one, two, three teams mm-hmm. that they'll fully fund as professional athletes through their sport funding. Um, and yeah, and those guys are all full time curlers. So at a Grand Slam, I guess about 80% now are full time curlers. Mm-hmm. Then, but in Canada, yeah, you're trying to use sponsorship and uh, find sponsorship to kind of supplement a lot of your expenses so that you can try to keep up with those guys. So a couple of things, though, but you guys do, especially if when you do well, because you win money in the bond yeah. spiels when you do well. So you guys do put a little bit of money in your pockets yeah. as well. Yeah. So Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. Like, as long as you're winning, mm-hmm. you, yeah. you, you basically, you got to win, um, I would say, probably the maybe top 10 in Canada are are making money and mm-hmm. but that's 10 men's teams 10 right. maybe 10 women probably right. not even 10 women's teams so to really maybe go deeper with his question can 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 you actually explain the adine situation like and well, what he's like or is that yeah. not something that you can really talk about uh it's yeah there's different situations in each country and like nick's a good friend and he's spoken about his situation, uh, Nick Adin from Sweden. Mm-hmm. He's seven-time world champion, and he uh, he gets paid a salary, not a huge amount of money, but a, a salary to uh, that basically pays his rent and stuff, um, and all his expenses are paid. But uh, outside of that, um, to do that, I, I don't think they keep a lot of their winnings. So. No. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so they don't keep their winnings. So, um, yeah, basically he's curled for 30, 40 years and uh, doesn't have a lot extra to his name. So I think mm. there's, even at a seven-time world champion, wow. like, but, um, yeah, so each country has different situations and, and it's different commitments for different guys. But, uh, yeah, his is a tough situation. Uh, I don't, sure. don't want to get you entangled in, in, in anything by saying something that you don't want to, but like if I'm hearing uh, that country and that country or Sweden is providing a, a base salary and maybe the, the trade off is that you're not getting a lot of the winnings, like you said, uh, would, and I'm assuming this has happened, Canadian curlers, especially our best, uh, I know it's a competitive field and there's so many great curlers across this country, men's and women's, would you guys as a whole not be looking at our olympic body and and our government being like well they're doing it yeah why can't we especially how big curling is yeah in in canada yeah and it's come a long way like um back to early 2000s there's a boycott with the players um with curling canada that until there was money for the briar and some funding and that type of stuff um they weren't going to play. So mm. that happened in the early 2000s. And um, and as we've moved on, like there's some Canadian funding um, that covers some of our costs and that type of stuff. But uh, just for the top three or four teams. Right. Um, and yeah, no, it would be great to see a little more come to the players for sure. Um, especially when you have a big event like the Briar, yeah. you know it's bringing them yeah. money. And, yeah, um, totally. But, uh, yeah, it has, I think, throughout my career so far, it's been it's been getting better each year, but it's still got a long way to go, I think, to compete with 
some of these other Scot- Scotland, Italy, Switzerland, like the Asian countries, they're all, um, yeah, it's it's not quite the same yet. Hmm. What would you prefer? A mixture of both? Like like I, a, like Tommy said, like a base salary and then a percentage of winnings? Is that, or that? It, you, it's it's yeah, hard. It, it, it's a tough situation, and it's for each team. It's different. Like uh, some teams that have a boatload of sponsorship right. um, versus a team that is just covering their expenses, mm-hmm. kind of thing. Like every team's a little bit different. Uh, we definitely like appreciate the support we get from Curling Canada, but at the same time, um, yeah, you're seeing some of these other countries yeah. just. Um, when they're putting it full in eight hour days, they're just getting so good so fast that, uh, yeah, it's, it's something that I know our governing body's looking at. And, um, one thing I do appreciate, they, we do have four, four, um, funded national teams on the women's Mm -hmm. men's side, whereas, Mm -hmm. so we do have a depth there. Yeah. uh, And that's been good for Canada over the years. Um, so it would, I, I think that I'd, I still like that better than going with one team and just throwing all your mm-hmm. eggs in that basket, especially when it's like if you look at our skips right now, Gushu, Kui, mm-hmm. um, they're older guys. If you like, you don't want to, you, you got to be putting some money in the future too. So, mm. um, yeah, with the depth, they got to spread it around a little bit more too. It's, it's a tough situation. I would say not necessarily even all that many years ago when. The, you win the Briar, you go to the Worlds, or you win the Scotties, you go to the Worlds, that Canada would be the favorite and win, you know, more often than not. Yeah. It's changed, hasn't it? Yeah, for sure. And, it, like, well, we talked about it with, even in the last slam, or last couple slams, you're watching, like, a James Craig out of Scotland. They're 20, 20 years old and coming out and... Uh, full-time curlers though and they're given every mm-hmm. every top team a run for their money and uh, the the parity among the top 16 in the world are it, anyone can beat anyone basically mm. so with europe starting to win more world championships more gold medals in the olympics than uh canada of late is that because they're that's their jobs their full-time jobs you think like, oh, they, they, they don't have to work in the I, middle I, of the briar like yeah, you're going to? Right? I would say it's part of it. Like, yeah, it's it's professional versus amateur is definitely, yeah. uh, it's it's not the same playing field. So, um, Well, you guys are still professional curlers. It's just not your full-time whole, job. Yeah, yeah. Full-time job, yeah. Well, I remember, wasn't it a few yeah. years ago? I mean, was it before the Olympics? I don't know, but the wasn't the Chinese national team in Leduc practicing for, like, the year or... They'll yeah, like they'll come up for a year at a time, or yeah. even like this Nick and the Swedish guys that like they'll play thirty six weekends in a year. Not wow. anymore as much, but when they were right in their yeah. y- kind of young prime, they'd live in Canada and play thirty six weeks. Like we'll play like <laughs> we'll play sixteen maybe. Yeah, it's and not, you're getting pushed to play more by the young guys yeah, on your team yeah. because they want to keep playing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah like, exactly. Listen, but, I got a wife and kid and a job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but yeah. Uh, yeah, it's interesting with curling that way. I hope it keeps growing and yeah. there comes a day where it's a professional. Like I'd love to see that for the Canadians to to have a, an avenue Circuit. where you can be professional. Um, and that's what I know my dad's been fighting for that for his whole career. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, it's we've seen it close. There's been a couple teams in Canada that probably had stretches where they didn't need to work, but you can't count on that forever. Mm-hmm. So every yeah, so far everyone in Canada is still kind of working and curling. I would ask you this too, especially seeing uh, these other countries at the top levels starting to get way more competitive. Like you said, any weekend anybody could win, kind of thing yeah. on the world stage. Is curling gaining traction at the minor and kids levels across the globe too? And now there's more interest. They're seeing it's not the old joke like I ah, have a cigarette and a beer and, uh, <laughs> yeah. and go to a bonds field. It's now hey you can make money and now it's an Olympic sport. So we're seeing a 
growth oh, globally that's oh, happening? Yeah, yeah huge growth gro- globally. Like in all these countries, especially the Asian ones, you go over there and they have huge junior programs. And really? like I know in China, they were putting like 100,000 kids through a program and like <laughs> trying in Shanghai, for and example. And it's going to take like, yeah. yeah. And yeah. like I think Canada's done an okay job. Um and we've probably kept a similar amount of those young curlers going, but uh, the world, throughout the world, it's growing like crazy. And you're watching it in all these new countries. That's the biggest thing that we keep seeing. The, all these, like uh, Nigeria has a team now, wow. and Israel just made a jump to the like from the up to the top of the B um, yeah. side, and like you're watching. A lot of countries that you'd never see in Africa and hmm. Middle East to kind of start coming up as well, and um, so yeah, globally it's it's growing like crazy. So it's that that's really exciting for what me. What about Canada though? Because like when I hear things of small towns, they're like, oh boy, like the plant needs replacing, and mm. is it actually worth spending this money to replace the plant or just shut the curling club down because we're not making any money? Uh, you hear that in Edmonton too. The Dare yeah. Club, I, f- I feel like, is on the verge of of mm-hmm. not having curling anymore. Uh, like, so is Canada falling behind in that? Yeah, I think it's getting quite expensive um, to run a curling club in Canada, and uh, like curling's been a fairly cheap sport for someone to join and mm-hmm. play, and um, and that's great. But at the same time. It's been so cheap that these clubs aren't able to keep the doors open. Mm-hmm. So uh, there, I think there's some really successful clubs that have made it fun and uh, kept things going, and maybe increased their co- um, yeah costs a little bit so that they can keep everything open. There's definitely some really good clubs across the country, um, but uh, there's yeah, I think this there's still a little bit of an old mindset that it, it should be like I don't know a couple hundred bucks for a league mm-hmm. for the whole year and and uh, without support through a municipality or something a lot of clubs are having a hard time keeping them doors open so Jeez. Uh, yeah no it's uh, I think in Canada they they just need to have a little bit of a change in mindset of how to run a business and um, and there will be some really successful curling clubs. It's just, uh, it's just a bit of an old s- mindset that a lot of the clubs are having trouble with right now. Interesting. So, if people are watching or whatever and have young kids that they would like to get into curling, where do they do that in Edmonton? Yeah, well, at the yeah, any of the curling clubs would have a junior program or a learn to curl program, depending on the age. Um, at the Saddle Center, they have a great junior program where I play out of, and uh, there's kids out there all the time, and especially in the summer. Like, the summer, they have summer camps every week all summer, and there's just, like, all 10 sheets have kids all over them. That's so great. that part's great, um, and you just hope that more clubs can do it. Uh, but I think, yeah, if you are going to start, you would start at your closest curling club and... And uh, they'd have a junior program for sure. Do you Shut run it? Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Do you run any camps at all? Or, yeah, yeah, at yeah. The yeah. yeah. Well, me and my dad do um, the okay. Kevin Martin Curling Academy. Okay. It's called. Cool. Uh, we've done it kind of all over the all over the place. We do a two week uh, summer camp every year. I, yeah, for less. I think he's in twenty eight oh, really? camps oh, okay. now. Yeah, um, but since I've been curling, I've been a part of it and. Uh, so we do that in the summer. We go to little towns all over Canada, kind of do weekend camps mm-hmm. whenever I have an off weekend. Um, so we're yeah definitely teaching all the time. I'll, I and I'll take younger junior teams out, or even some of the the more competitive names that you'd maybe see on TV. You go teach them to sweep or whatever. So hmm. it doesn't really matter the level. Uh, oh, I'm cool. definitely willing to help for sure. I was going to give a shout out to Shamrock Curling Club. Uh, our buddy Gavin Morton, who I worked with at the Oilers, is running it now. Yeah. Seems to be having the time of his life. <laughs> yeah. You can get six o'clock or logger on tap, which we took advantage of we at did. the Oilers Alumni Bond Spiel. That was a lot of fun. Sheet yeah. Disturbers. I played two games. Uh, I got a point. 
That was my big highlight, and we won. <laughs> yeah, the so. Shamrock is one of those like success stories. It's a really old club, has a sand base. Like yeah. it, it's like it wouldn't be great ice because of the situation, but yet the club is packed. It's young. They have like a ton of young curlers. Yes. all every day of the week, and it's a huge party atmosphere. And they they've done great, and they've been there for a long time. So, uh, yeah, we've had. Some curling clubs like Derek, we're not sure of, but th- th- there's these success stories throughout the city as well. And the irony, if you ask him, about, and his dad has now been recruited by Curling USA, so he's spending more of his time in the States getting oh, kids into well, curling yeah. and growing the game. And, and if they're so throwing I, some shekels at you, like, <laughs> yeah. why not? Right. right? And, and that's, I guess, kind of like uh, I feel like Canada's missing the boat here. And when you got like a Kevin Martin, and yes, US, Curling USA is getting them to do. Hello, Curling Canada. Mm. Why don't you get I, this going b- bigger and better in I, Canada? Yeah, I think yeah. we have seen that in in all types of aspects of the sport, where our best type of, our best curlers have went to other countries to either help their programs or help grow the game, and it has been great worldwide. Um, but yeah, I think Canada could use a little more help with some of our best curlers. Looking after their own a little bit. Yeah. More. yeah. Wait a minute, no. Is David Murdoch working not working for Curling Canada? Yeah, no. David so Murdoch's our Scotland. high performance director and from, he's from Scotland. Yeah. So yeah. what's going on here? Someone from Scotland's coming over yeah. to run the Well it, but the whole thing's just getting more international, which is good. Yeah, yeah. And for sure. I'm just wait there's gonna be a day. Where the like, I think the Grand Slams keep getting bigger, and you might see an international team put together, like where you just oh. they just Ooh. go win the pro circuits. So. Oh, okay. this, this has got some text coming in 780 218 9999 Paris Jewelers inbox. If you have any questions for Karik or any of the guys, fire those our way. Uh, a comment from Neil, and then there's another question for Karik that I want to get to. But Neil says, Right now, there is little to no support from the city of Edmonton. For the clubs here, two have had to shut down due to the equipment being old and no money available to do the replacements. It's difficult to sustain the clubs, like Karik said. It sh- it would be nice to have the funding for the clubs, like the rinks do, for hockey. Cheers from Neil. So a uh, commentary there. and uh, Yeah, completely yeah, agree. Uh, yeah. Completely yeah. agree, yeah. fair enough. And then Truck in the Park uh, wants to know, how tough was the change in teams for Karik from Truck in the Park? Yeah, no, it 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 is it has been tough. Like you play with Brendan and Brad for ten years, and um, you just go to the rink, kind of expecting <laughs> to know like how they're gonna throw it and what they're gonna do. Like I could basically um, just I was in their head. I yeah. knew exactly what they were thinking, what they were gonna do, how they're gonna throw the rock in certain situations, all those type of things. So uh, this has definitely been a new adventure with Kev. Uh, but to play with one of the greatest curlers of all time, there's, like I said, he's exciting. He makes shots that no one else makes. Um, so those type of things are really exciting. And then we got two young guys who you're going to watch for the next 20 years that we get to kind of teach and bring up. And, um, yeah, that's exciting too. And hopefully we can get them to a point where we can make, get some wins out of the young guys yeah. before we're done. How long till you're uh, in Kevin's head that you know he's firing those missiles? <laughs> oh, oh, I, I know when it's coming. Like, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. You said there's the he's, ones he's, with the extra little pep oh, on them, too. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, yeah, those, the, there's always a couple surprises when it's really hard. Yeah. Like, even when he doesn't need to, he's still got it. He's, like, I think he's almost 50 years old now, and, like, I don't see him stepping down anytime soon. Like, <laughs> he's fit and healthy, flexible yeah. and healthy and, like, and throws it and ha- throws it hard and has a ton of fun. So he's kind of just a special in that way and yeah it's great great uh, it's been tough in some regards but in some it's like a new adventure and really exciting as well hmm. is he not the more the modern day kevin martin the way he plays yeah well he yeah definitely yeah, excited yeah yeah for sure like mm-hmm. i think when we watched uh at one he would have got a lot of that having to keep up with that yeah. as well <laughs> like, yeah because he was uh, young when you're done yeah, but yeah. yeah you watch someone um how how dad made things happen how he, he won games and uh, the strategy that came out of that and kev definitely has some of that especially the aggressive side of it and um 
I, one thing I like about the way that we play now is because he's so aggressive and puts so much pressure on teams. Uh, if if you play really good with his strategy, you're going to win. Uh, it puts a lot of pressure on you to play really good all the time, mm-hmm. but um, you when you play your best, you, you win. So mm-hmm. um, I, I do really enjoy that part of it. Another question comes in from Pat in the county. He says, can you ask Kark why there is such a turnover on teams? Is it to keep things fresh? Yeah, I think part of it is you're seeing a lot of the older guys retiring and mm-hmm. um, and then just trying to find a good mix and a good chemistry that's going to be able to compete with. It's not just about having four talented guys. You need the chemistry there too and to compete with these world teams. Um, so finding that, it takes a couple of years. And um, yeah, you're seeing if you go to a Grand Slam now, the average age across the sheets is probably 25. Wow. <laughs> and wow. Wow. even 10 years ago, it was 35. Yeah. And 20 yeah. years ago, mm-hmm. it was 45. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah, like, yeah it's, it's, the, it's the Olympic cycle too, right? They change, right. Teams change because they want to build towards that a goal of getting to the Olympic qualifying, qualifying for the Canadian Olympic qualifier, getting there and having the best chance uh, possible of getting to the Olympics. Is that not part of it too? Yeah, yeah. You're just trying to find a way to get there, get get to the Olympics and then win the Olympics. Like that's the goal. So um, yeah, it takes, it might take a couple of changes to kind of make the team into something you think can win. Is it like super teams? It, starting to, to evolve basically it's definitely super teams like yeah. you're seeing teams from all over there's very few well I, none anymore i think that play all four people are from that province mm-hmm. at least in the men's side mm-hmm. um, so yeah no it's it, it you, you need to to keep up like the other countries aren't sticking to their provinces right <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I gotta well you talked about an international dream okay so Kark Martin's the the lead and you're building the best international <laughs> curling team that you're gonna play on who's your who are you uh, curling who are you play who are you picking to curl with yeah oh it'd be tough like there's so, so many there's good ones yeah. so many good ones yeah I don't know that's uh, a tough question it is <laughs> but you gotta probably take Nick if you're playing in the Olympics or a world champ, right? Like he's just, he he's showing. He just he wins. He, mm-hmm. Yeah, Hedin, yeah. yeah, and um, yeah, I know uh, Grant Hardy. He's him and Oscar Erickson are two of the best. One of those two at third, probably. Um, Who are they with? I'm not um, sure. Hardy's with Moet. Okay. And uh, Oscar Erickson's with Nick Hedin. Um, okay. So those two international, two of the best, um, and then the front end, uh, uh, you just want someone big and strong, like, uh, and then can throw peels like crazy down the <laughs> middle. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not sure who the best second would be, but yeah, it would be interesting to think of yeah, for I'm sure. Yeah, kidding. That's great. It's the ST Hangout, Tal Gazzola, Joaquin Gage, Murray McCourt, and Kark Martin from Team Cooey. Uh, any other questions? 7802189999. Uh, did you guys, how much hockey did you talk? Because I came in late. Did you guys talk about the game today? No, no, no. we haven't talked about it at all. Yeah. Oilers and yeah. Blues, everybody's happy after the Oilers opened up for eight what? goals against Detroit. Like, well, are we satisfied? Are we worried? You came on the post game show after doing <laughs> yeah. brilliant work on the broadcast. Oh, thanks, thanks. Um, but yeah, hey, anyone want to take a crack at what we expect Just tonight? St. Louis rolled into a depleted Toronto lineup and got steamrolled by Toronto, so they're going to get steamrolled by the Oilers tonight. I think mm-hmm. my uh, my old uh, well, one of my old demons coaching the Blues, now. Drew Bannister. Drew Bannister, oh, yeah, nice. played with him in uh, in Germany. Um, former Oiler too. Former Oiler, yeah. Yeah, good for him. It's funny. Just I never so weird. Some players that you know that would that was their path is probably coaching. That's I never would have guessed that for him. I didn't think that was uh, that was what he would uh, go into. But good, uh, unreal. Um, very serious guy though. So I guess really? yeah, he's. I mean, he has fun too. But he's he's quite serious. But I yeah, I, I don't like 
I don't like the Oilers' chances tonight for some reason. What? Weird. Oh. Yeah. You're a hockey guy. Yeah, right? yeah. So what are you thinking of uh, this whole well, situation with the Oilers so far this year? I, I think I think like McDavid, he, he like any of these athletes get on a roll, and you see him get six points last night. He, 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 I'd like to see that continue. That's something that but, came up on but the But you post get that show. confidence. And, yeah. yeah. It was like a casual six points, yeah. too, the other night. Like, yes, no goals, six apples. Right? I know. Four in the third period. So, yeah. yeah, Gage, you don't like how it's lining up tonight. But Why? Like, I'm curious like your analogy analogy David why. goes for six. He pops off, and it's like, oh, he's got six tonight. Uh, yeah. So it's funny because at the game, I, I find I... I mean, it's tough because Gene and I are talking half the time. But yeah, no, I, I, I tried to focus in. There's one aspect of the Oilers game that I can always kind of justify if they're going to be good or not. Yeah. yeah. So um, first ten minutes, the 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 transportation from the D men to the forwards with the puck. So essentially, after a turnover, they gain possession. When the defense are transferring it to the forwards. That first pass is so important. Yep. Right? Tape to tape, yep. hitting guys in stride, making sure they get through. And for the first 10 minutes, there wasn't many of them. I mean, even Bouchard, I remember it because it was the first play of the game, came back, missed pass. Detroit came back, had a chance. It happened the second time. Detroit had a So I was like, oh, my God, they can't make a pass. And it wasn't until about the 10-minute mark until they started breaking out clean. Not a, well, I shouldn't say clean, but just a, as long as they made that first pass, getting out of their zone, they started to get to the uh, to the offensive side, and that's when you saw Leon score that goal. Mm-hmm. But the the starts are concerning to me. Like it, they're not uh, they're 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 impersonating Tommy. Be they're late to the games all the time. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> to me, the the one thing that's changed a little bit from that fourteen game stretch, especially the beginning of it, seemed like they were really responsible defensively. Yeah. And the goals were just happening for them, but they were maintaining that really responsive defensive play, which you don't see out the Oilers yeah. all the time. It's not very well. And uh, like. I've seen it get away from that a little bit. So on the other side, of the, I'd be a little worried. They need to get back to making sure they're responsible defensively, and then and the goals will happen. Yeah, yeah. that second period, like you're mentioning, the defensive it side of it was super loose, very sloppy, yeah. Uh, here's a question that I'm curious for all your guys' opinions on. Everyone's talking about how the Oilers need an upgrade on defense, and they got this guy, Philip Roberg, that we all expected to take a step forward this year, never did, was riding the pine. They finally sent him back down. He's been playing extremely well in Baco. We all know that defensemen take some more time to develop. Big rumors that he's going to be moved at the trade deadline for, for something, but... I, I just have in my mind, I wouldn't mind seeing him come up and get a few more games. Just to, I mean, he's a young guy. That's a good asset that maybe you could get a rental. But maybe after a little bit more time in the minors, maybe he is ready to – has the confidence back and come back into the lineup and elevate his game and elevate the, the Oilers' decor a little bit uh, right yeah. now. Uh, he, he's nicked up right now. Yeah, uh, he got banged up in Baco the like other day. Uh, I, I thought he was going to be moved, Murray, especially when his agent pulled that. Hey, we're trying to. We would like to negotiate a trade. Um, by all accounts, it was the agent. It wasn't Philip himself. Now, listen, like those guys talk to each other almost every day. So anyway, besides that, I thought, hey, he's going to be uh, moved out. But apparently, there's still a plan for him in the future as a member of the Oilers, and I was like, oh, okay, but if there's a piece that you can get and it comes at the cost of Philip Roberg and you're going for it now, I think the Oilers would definitely consider that. I don't know if that's going to happen, though. What we've seen from him, though, and I think it's fair to say, is he has not elevated his game to playing consistently in the NHL, and that's hard for defensemen. How long did it take Bouchard? We're still complaining about Bouchard, how bad he was at the start of this year, right? This is... His third full season in the National Hockey League. So uh, it's fickle for defensemen, but we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, yeah I, I, I'm I, like you. I'd like to see more, but it's a it's a very short leash. Yeah. He, has to, he has to show that he can do something now, I yeah. think. Because the, the skills there, you saw, it's, it's always tough with players, highly skilled guys, because they show glimpses. Right, they show you like there was parts in the playoffs last year, was it or some? He was just defending so well. I go, okay, 
He's getting He's it. getting it. He's, yeah. It's coming now. But then I'm like, you see some other decision making, and he's trying to... I felt that his preseason was a huge step back because there was... Yeah. A, Ekholm got injured, and he was playing 20, whatever, 23, 23 minutes. Yeah, and I, yeah, he, yeah. he didn't look like he was a guy that's been in the NHL before. He looked like a young rookie again. So um, that kind of... It didn't start well, and it hasn't ended well so far. Am I... I look to starting the playoffs with the obviously seven, he's your seventh guy. I'm okay with it if he has to go in because he d- has done it before, like he's played at the NHL level. Mm-hmm. But if there's something a little more solid, it's just giving up an ass. Yeah. 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 Well, I'm just concerned about because the, the cover's pretty bare. Yeah, I for know. The moving forward to yeah. move. I realize if you know they if they're all in, they're all in. They got to move some assets. But boy, <laughs> I hate to give up. You any thoughts on that, card? Uh, no, it's yeah. We're you'd like to see him go for it, but yeah, it's it's it's, it's a tough situation. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's a fine line, that's for yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, by the way, uh, Hudson's White Avenue. I'm on location, 4:30 p.m. for the Oil Stream pregame show. Come on down. Uh, we have a bunch of GCs to give away. It's always a good time at Hudson's. Uh, and uh, Kark, thanks for coming in. Murray, always great to see you. Gager. You wearing your slippers? Yes, yes you are. Right. Of course you are. You've got uh, two guys in a goalie coming up. Glad to see VIP Golf Show uh, makes its return, what, end of March? End of April. End of April, April that's April, right. Yeah. Uh, Kark, best of luck. Thanks for coming in. Really Thank you. appreciate it. The Lock Shop coming up next. That was the EST Hangout presented by White Claw. I'm Tom Gazzola for Kark Martin, Murray McCourt, and Joaquin Gage. Uh, we'll talk to you in a little bit.